My name is Kathy Marin. I am one of the counselors here at Del Norte High School. It's good to see all of you. Uh, we know that this is a uh, challenging time right now, and uh, you're probably wanting a lot of information as we have been navigating these uncertain times, but we want to reassure you that we are here to answer questions. Um, we're going to be covering a lot uh, tonight, so I want to go ahead and get started. Um, this is the class of 2022. It's hard to believe that uh, how time flies, but um, your students will graduate one year from now. And so these are the counselors, and we have several of them with us tonight. Um, we have Mrs. Kinneman and Mr. Rohde, uh, Ms. Chase, Mr. Luna, and myself. We also have um, Michelle Hines, who runs our student services, and then our guidance techs, Susan Reich and Jamie Stone. So tonight we're gonna to be covering quite a few um, agenda items. We'll be going over graduation requirements. We'll be going over the course requests and picking senior classes kind of briefly and what that timeline is going to look like for your students. We'll be going over how to review a transcript, options after high school, some college planning, which will include um, kind of a brief overview of different types of applications that your students may encounter college entrance requirements, uh, standardized testing. We know that there's a lot of questions going on uh, about standardized testing right now. NCAA, our Naviance College and Career Planning Tool, and some additional resources that we'll have throughout the spring and fall to uh, support your students. So the first thing is to go over graduation requirements. Um, your students have seen this each and every year. They will see it again when they uh, get their course request presentation in class. It's a minimum of 230 credits in order to graduate. Of those 230 credits, they need them in particular subjects. So what that means is that a student could potentially have many more credits than that, but they also in conjunction have to have it in specific subject areas. So those subject areas in English is 40 credits and each class is worth five credits. So that means that they take English each and every year, 10 credits per year. Social science or social studies, they took it uh, last year, world history or AP European history, US history, and then next year they'll have civics and econ or we'll be able to choose uh, AP Gov. Science is 20 credits, which will be a year of life science and a year of, uh, which is a biological science and a year of a physical science. Math, 20 credits to graduate. Our students generally have math each and every year, so many have more than that. That's including um, the minimum of integrated math 1A, 1B, and we do know that our students come in at different levels, and many students have completed that prior to high school, so that's okay. This is just a minimum. Um, PE and health sometimes is confusing. It's actually 25 credits altogether. It's 20 credits of PE and five credits of health. In freshman year, they took five credits of health and two PE. So generally, um, either students have completed it already or they're still completing that extra 10 credits. Fine arts is five credits to graduate. Um, and they also could satisfy that with a foreign language and an additional fine art. And then there's 85 elective credits. And keep in mind those 85 elective credits um, even though the students wish that it was all completely elective, a lot of it is what we call academic elective credits as well. So our course request form process, we call that the CRF for short, the CRF packet. Um, that will actually take place this week. So your students will be receiving their classroom presentations this week and early next week they will be picking their senior year courses and that'll be the final time that they do that in their high school careers. So the classroom presentations will be through the US history classes on Friday, February 5th. And then if a student is not in US history this trimester, because we know we do have some, we have some other days where we'll be offering times and the students will get a link because we know who they are. And that will be, um, February 8th, which will be during fifth period. And, um, oh, and I'm seeing that's 110 to 210, that's not correct. Um, it's the full fifth period. 
and uh, 220 to 320 on uh, which is tutorial and then also on Tuesday. So we'll have it Monday during tutorial and Tuesday during tutorial. So fifth period on Monday and then tutorial and then tutorial on Tuesday. We also ask um, that you encourage your student to speak to their teachers for their course recommendations. And also to keep in mind that we will be offering the lunchtime AP informational meetings that normally they have, but we'll be doing it virtually this year. And so there's always questions having to do with courses and what's appropriate for your student. And so we do have uh, drop-in sessions where you can meet with the counselors. And our drop-in sessions, our parent drop-in sessions will be via Zoom. Again, we'll supply those links. That will be Monday, March 1st, and it'll be a period of time from 1.30 to 4. Uh, and then the student drop-in sessions will be Friday, February 26th from 8 to 10. It is an asynchronous day. So if a student um, perhaps doesn't have class or only has to sign in for a short time, we, are, we will be available during that time. And then also um, Friday, March 5th from 8 to 10, and then again, 1 to 3. So those will be our timeframes where your students can meet with us. Um, to check in and kind of go over their different um, questions, general questions that they may have. Big question has been, we've been getting a lot of emails about how do I get my students transcript? And so what we've done is we have set up a time where we're going to do a, um, a drive-through. It'll be in the parking lot, so and we'll do it by alpha split. We're doing that as a convenience rather than grade level because you may have multiple children and multiple levels. So um, we will be doing A through G on Wednesday, February 10th from 1 to 3.30, H through O, Thursday, February 11th, 1 to 3.30, and then P through Z, and anyone who couldn't make it the other days can come on Friday, February 12th from 1 to 3.30. So you'll be able to pick up an actual physical copy of your student's transcript. And then this is understanding your student's transcript. So once you've picked it up, how do you read it? It looks a little different than what's on that course history. And so um, kind of the easiest way to look at it is that um, each trimester, there's a set of courses, obviously with a GPA, um, generally, the ones that have the P's or the AHP's next to it, those are the academic courses and also are the UC approved courses. The majority of the courses will have that, but you'll notice that things like PE, um, maybe if a student took um, a academic tutor, um, the seminar courses as part of the UC pattern, and I'll talk about those in a minute because they actually go in a different part of the application. Um, and then you'll also see a work in progress. The work in progress, so when your student picks up their transcript, it's all the courses throughout the year. So it will reflect the courses until the end of the year. And then you'll also see a box that I'll highlight in the next slide. That's the credit summary and also the GPA summary. And so one of the things that we ask juniors to do specifically when they pick up their transcripts is to double check their credits for senior year. So many, many of our students will be ahead of, on credits and that's fine. We have students that graduate anywhere from 230 to 300 credits, depending on uh, what they've taken, how many off rolls and so on and so forth. And so the first column is the 230, and it breaks it down into each of those categories that um, I was talking about earlier in the different subject areas. The next column is where you see COMP, that's completed credits. And those are the credits that your student has earned credit up to that point. The WIP is work in progress. That's everything that they're scheduled out for until the end of this year. And the most important column heading into senior year is what do they still need to take in order to meet graduation requirements? So many of our students um, will be varied, but many of them will head into senior year with similar to what's being shown, about 25 or 30 credits. All students will need English and they will definitely need civics and econ. 
Those are two senior level courses. The other area that many of our students end up needing is PE. For whatever reason, a lot of our students put it off till senior year. So if they um, still need it, they need to schedule out and or you know possibly do an athletic waiver, but even that's kind of been up in the air. So um, right now, that's gonna be the most important column. They may have electives left. They may have, let's say they took, um, you know, they didn't satisfy life science. Maybe they took a biochem chem in freshman year and didn't finish it. Um, so that's the, the column really to pay attention to in order to schedule it out and make sure first and foremost that they're scheduled out for what they need to graduate. This is what it looks like. We do have students and we offer students to repeat classes. Um, they can repeat, uh, particularly if they have an F in a class, if it's a graduation requirement, they must repeat it. But this is what it looks like when uh, it is repeated out on a transcript. So in this case, the student took integrated 1A and earned a D the first time, and then decided to repeat it and earned an A. So the first class is designated with a small r, which means that the class has been repeated out. And it is, it is also zeroed out of the GPA. And those credits move to and are inclusive of the GPA on the repeated class. So that's why it benefits students to repeat classes. And when they do repeat classes, in order for this to work, it must be the same course and the same course number for that to happen. And they can repeat classes in their senior year. So GPA and rank, we are a school that does not report rank. Um, there are two GPAs on the transcript. There is the cumulative GPA and an academic GPA. So basically an unweighted and a weighted GPA. And a student would earn the weighted GPA by taking advanced placement courses. And now we do have two capstone honors courses. We actually we actually offer four honors courses. Um, the two English are not weighted, but the two, what we call Project Lead the Way capstone courses are. And they, they are Project Lead the Way, which means that they are the second or higher level, uh, second or third level course in Project Lead the Way. And those are in honors medical intervention and honors principles of engineering. So one thing about taking or thinking about the classes in senior year, a lot of it has to do with what are, what are your plans senior year? What is the student's plan? Um, if planning to go on to college, um, what they take in senior year really matters. And so colleges look for the quality of the senior year program. So they're looking to make sure that a student is keeping the number of content and rigor that they have, particularly um, for UCs and Cal States, and fulfilling their A through G requirements. Also, they look for taking courses across all academic areas. So continuing on in math, continuing on in science, um, keeping their senior year academically strong. As part of the college application process, they do list all the courses that they're taking senior year. Um, and in some cases do report uh, first trimester courses during the process as, as well. It really just depends on when their, their um, application deadlines are. Maintaining good, st strong study habits and good grades. Um, one thing about college applications is that it's not over till it's over. They have to send in a final transcript. So they do have to maintain strong grades throughout their senior year. Um, and it matters. It matters whether you're attending, going to community college, university, military, or a trade school education continues and they're just building one on top of the other. So one of the questions is, do I have to take math in senior year? Do I have to take science? Um, you know, we encourage them to, it depends on where they are credit wise, but the reality is when they go to a university or they go to a community college, they take standardized testing, they will do more math. So um, that's why we encourage them. Um, is it required? No, depending on their particular personal courses. Um, so I'll go on to the next one. Options after high school, a lot of different options. And we have students do all of these. Go straight to work. We do have students that join the military every year, college and technical schools, community college, 
community college transferring to a university, four-year universities considering in-state and out-of-state and public versus private colleges. And we do also have students now that are applying to international schools as well. Another growing trend is taking a gap year. Some students now are doing other things. They may be um, traveling, um, they may be tutoring, they may be volunteering and doing other things um, for another year before they go on to college. So military choices, there's a lot of different branches of the military. Um, do know that they do visit on campus each year. So our students do have access to military recruiters. Um, one thing that I always say to students is make sure you don't sign anything until you understand, well, number one, talk to your parents and um, hopefully it's a family um, conversation and not to sign anything until you understand everything um, and all the terms. Um, the students have to take something called ASVAB, and that ASVAB is kind of similar to the SAT, but it's it's for the military. It's specific to the military, um, and it does help in job classification as well. And so the branches of the military, there's quite a few of them, Marines, Air Force, Navy, Army, Coast Guard. Um, we have students do the reserves. We have students do military academies every year, and also ROTC. Um, if your student is considering one of the military academies, um, it's a good idea to connect with their counselor early because they do need to get congressional nominations and that does take some additional time and some additional paperwork. So um, if your student is considering a military academy, um, probably meeting with a counselor fairly early is a good idea. So career technical schools, these tend to be specialty programs. Um, they're more uh, programs that may be uh, several months, maybe a year to a few years. Um, and they train your student or train workers to go straight to the workforce. Um, and they will vary considerably in price. So that's something to consider, but it is specific training to the workforce. Here in California, we are incredibly lucky. There are 116 community colleges statewide. Um, they can be searched by majors and, and specific campuses. We do have students that have gone on to community colleges um, all over the state. There are um, eight here in San Diego County, uh, Palomar, Miramar, Mesa, City, Maricosta, Grossmont, Cuyamaca, and Southwestern. Um, consideration for that is also something called the California College Promise. Palomar, which I'll go over in a minute, calls, the, calls it the Palomar Promise, um, but this is a uh, financial incentive for students in their first couple of years of community college. And so what would be the reasons for, um, you know, considering community college? They have an open door policy. They don't require the SAT or the SAT, although they may use those scores to help in math um, and English placement. It does not require completion of all of the A through G courses that the UCs and CSUs require. And then there's options. Um, you can go and do a work training program to get a certificate, an associate degree, which is two years, an associate with a transfer option to a four-year college or you'd excuse me, university, and a transfer um, or transfer to four-year college university. The other thing is that some of the community colleges are actually offering, there's a few of them that are actually starting to offer four-year degrees as well now. So reasons to consider community college, affordability, it's very economical as compared to the cost of some, of, some colleges out there. Um, maybe you're not, you're unsure about attending college. Maybe you just want to try a few classes and not commit to something full-time quite yet. I'm undecided about a major program. Maybe you need some more time to develop uh, academic growth and to build skills or possibly interested in a direct career oriented degree, uh, fashion design, cul culinary, dental hygiene, um, cosmetology, um, maybe landscaping. There are quite a few different career-oriented programs, and they differ depending on the community colleges as well as to what's offered. 
Also flexibility and scheduling. Um, if you have work uh, commitments or outside commitments. Um, and the other thing is that maybe you just wanna be close to home or maybe you wanna live at home. Um, and uh, there's, so go on to the next one, Palomar College. That's our local feeder college. Um, and so uh, generally um, the Palomar Promise is offered. Um, this is kind of a, a something having to do with the cost. You could get up to the first two years for first time students, um, a California residents. You have to be a full time student, which is required minimum of 12 units. Um, the student has to maintain good academic standing, which is a, for them is a 2.0 or higher, is not dependent on parent income or grades um, in high school. So uh, a lot of times we'll hear parents say, oh, well, I won't, well, my family won't qualify, but it's not dependent on that. But you are required to fill out the federal aid form. And uh, once the student does the Palomar application, it's in the student portal. They do the federal aid form. And then there's also a first year experience program that helps with retention. We do recommend with Palomar to get started on the process in October. And we usually have Palomar College outreach um, representatives that come on campus in late fall to help students with the process as well. And so that's kind of the financial piece to Palomar. Um, UC and CSU requirements. Again, this is something that our students hear pretty much every year from the time they start in ninth grade. We always do, during that CRF process, we always do a comparison between um, graduation requirements and UC CSU requirements. And the other reason that we do it is that if a student is planning on going to a four-year school, even though we call them A through G requirements because that's what our state system calls them, we know that generally if students follow this, they're going to be pretty well set for most colleges, most four-year colleges out there. Um, obviously, the more competitive the college is, the more years in each category that your student would want to take, particularly in the math and the lab sciences. There are some states that do require, even though Cal States and UCs only require two years minimum, there are states that do require three and four years. And so with that, you'll notice in, in um, social science, it's the same, um, it's actually less than graduation. So they're gonna cover that for graduation. English is the same. Math, the, the students do need minimally to get through 3A, 3B of integrated math. And what they take in middle school does count towards that. It doesn't count towards graduation, but it does count towards um, meeting the math requirement for the Cal State and UCs. Lab sciences, Again, it meets graduation requirements, so they're good there. World language, two years of the same language, and think of that in pairs. So if they take Spanish one, two, three, four, five, six, that would be equivalent to three years. The visual and performing arts, they need to do one year of um, a, a, a certain, a, the same discipline, but they can do it in two different years. So we have had students who've done one freshman year and they realize they never took the second half of it and they'll schedule it into their senior year and that's fine. And then what we call a G elective, which is a college prep elective, and that's a full year. They have to meet the A through, A through G requirements with C grades or better. So the UCs and Cal States do not recognize a D grade as meeting the subject requirements. A D does meet graduation requirements, but it does not meet A through G subject requirements. So we always get questioned on the CRF, well, what is, do I have to take a G elective? And that answer is no, you don't have to specifically take a course in the G elective area because you can utilize an extra course in any of the categories A through F to fulfill G. So that means if they're over and above in math and they have an extra math class, they've already done their three years or four years and they have a fifth, sixth, seventh year equivalent in math, they can utilize that to, to um, satisfy the G course, an extra year of science to satisfy the G course. Those are often the two most common that students use if they don't take an actual G elective. And those G electives 
um, when they get the CRFs are things like the AP Human Geography, Psychology, um, Computer Sciences. There's a, there's quite a few of them in that category now. The um, a lot of the business courses are all also in that category. Um, sample courses that do not count in A through G are PE. Um, and also we have a few non-designated what we call service courses. So academic tutor, library, um, ASB. However, when they do take these service courses and utilize those credits towards graduation, um, there are parts of the UC where they can put that information in that they've actually taken those courses. It just doesn't satisfy the subject uh, designations A through G. And so these are, this is the UC and the CSU. So for both, they still have to fulfill those A through G requirements with C's or better. So we do encourage students because it also helps their GPA to repeat a D and definitely an F because they need to have the C grade or higher. Um, with a UC, a C grade stands. Um, however, they if they do repeat a C for some reason, they, they just report all of their repeated grades. So no matter what they've done, they, they'll report all the repeated grades. For the Cal State, um, they only have to report their repeated grades. So the difference is on UC, you have to put down every course that you've taken. On the CSU, they can put their repeated grades down only if they've repeated those. So that's kind of the small difference between those two. And we do help students during senior year with those differentiations. Um, this is always a confusing, the next one is uh, about eight trimesters of the weighted class to receive the extra point. It doesn't mean that they're not looking at all of the AP and the GPA of the student. What that means, it has to do with their academic GPA um, that they're being evaluated as part of the admissions process. So that's always confusing um, and it's concerning this to, to families. Like, what do you mean they don't look at all of the APs? They do. It, it just has to do with the GPA calculation that they utilize for their systems. Um, and then of course, if students apply outside the CSU and UC system, it's, what, it's what's on their transcript. Um, here's the big one. The, we're getting a ton of questions about um, standardized testing, SAT and ACT, and I go into this a little bit more shortly. The UCs have suspended the use of standardized test scores through the fall of 2024. Um, does that mean that students have to take it? Technically not, um, because they're not going to use it as part of the admissions criteria. That's for UC, and that's what they have announced up to this point. Um, however, the CSU has not told us yet for class of 2022. They have said 2021, and generally they tend to follow suit for the UCs, but it is too early yet for any of us to know exactly what the um, what testing is gonna look like for the class of 2022. It will start to unfold throughout the spring and we'll start to get more notifications throughout the spring. Uh, but right now they're, they're still focused on class of 2021. But we do know that the UCs have at this point suspended that the use of that for admissions purposes. So what does that mean? They're gonna rel be relying on different, the other parts of the application. Um, also know that they recognize that the courses from last spring that are listed with credit, they are recognizing that even though they don't actually have grades, that they will fulfill the subject requirements in the A through G that were completed during that time. So now let's start getting into um, some of the four-year information and the application information. So the Cal State Universities, there are 23 campuses for the Cal State Universities. So there's a, a wide variety of, of uh, Cal State Universities. And the University of California, there are nine campuses. So you kind of see them all over on that map. So these are the 23 Cal State Universities. We're lucky enough to have San Diego State here. 
in San Marcos. San Marcos, if you haven't been on their campus recently, they've done a tremendous amount of building. And then of course, San Diego State's about to expand also. So for the Cal State University admissions, um, the application period for Cal State, the application opens on October 1st of senior year. And generally it closes traditionally on November 30th. And the reason that I'm saying that is that this year they extended it to December 4th. And then a few of the campuses extended it beyond that. But their traditional deadline is November 30th. So we tell the students like set the goal for that. Um, and if it changes, then it, it will be announced. The Cal State University application is pretty straightforward. There's no letters of recommendation. Uh, they have to report all of their A through G coursework. Again, we don't know yet to be determined on the SAT, ACT scores, but generally we'll, you know, thinking that they probably will follow suit. Um, it, they calculate the GPA in courses taken after the ninth grade. So the GPA from A through G courses taken after the ninth grade. So we often get the question, does, so ninth grade doesn't count? Well, yes, it does because you, you're, you're fulfilling subject requ requirements. Um, there is a CSU eligibility index and there's a really good GPA, um, high school GPA calculator on the CSU website. So it's kind of fun to play around with it and stick in different grades and things like that to kind of come up with what we call predicted GPA of what their coursework is, um, where they're at right now. So they'll be able to enter the grades and it calculates their GPA for them. So with the UCs, the University of California, there are uh, nine different campuses for that. And this is the information for the Cal State admissions application. That application period opens on August 1st. So it'll be August 1st, 2021. The submission again is, is uh, to November 30th. So what the UCs do is that they open up their application, give students August, September, and October to work on the application, and then they can start submitting um, in November. They do go over a holistic review, which is called the UC Comprehensive Review. You can Google that and it will come up with all the different things that they look at. It's about a 14 different point uh, list of things that they look at. Um, no student is going to have all 14 things, so don't try, um, but they do, it, it'll kind of give you an idea of some of the things that, that uh, when they do their holistic review, what they're looking for. There are no letters of recommendation also. So again, Cal State UC's no letters of recommendation. Um, occasionally, Berkeley is the only one for some reason up to this point that after application, they may invite a student to submit a letter of recommendation. Um, so that could be an option, but the student would get that uh, directly. Otherwise, there's no letters of recommendation upon submission of the application. Again, the A through G coursework, quality of the senior year, and I point that out because it's on that UC comprehensive review sheet. This is where essays come in. So Cal State, there are no questions. Um, the Cal State, the UCs, they have require a student to fill out four personal insight questions, and they can choose four personal insight questions to answer out of eight prompts. They call them personal insight questions because they're not long essays. They're 350 words each. So they really want the student to stick to the prompt and answer the question. Um, they are not considering the SAT and ACT scores right now for admission. The GPA again is A through G coursework taken after the ninth grade. And different from the Cal State, they do, this is where the student can list extracurricular activities, community service, leadership, awards, et cetera. So their application is more extensive than the Cal State application, which is why they open it August 1st. So the UCs also have what they call eligible in the local context. And these, um, this is a guarantee to California high school students. They have it in the statewide context and they have it in the local context. 
what this means is that if you rank within the top of your graduating class, you're guaranteed a spot at a UC, but not necessarily the one that you apply to. So it's not a guarantee to this specific campus just because you apply. Um, if you don't get into the campuses of your choice or that you apply to, they will offer you a spot somewhere within, um, within the university system. So generally what happens is at the end of junior year, if you're eligible for that, you may receive um, a letter from the UCs actually saying that you're eligible for that. So that comes later on in the spring. It's not something we determine, it's just something that the UCs determine. So in addition to that private schools, um, what you wanna do is check with each school. Um, many of the private schools, so they will have applications on their own websites. You'll check with the school. Um, most of them will require the application. They may require a letter or two of recommendation. Um, this is where official transcripts may come in. What's called a secondary school report, that's something that the counselor fills out. Um, they may or may not require a letter of recommendation from a counselor. And, um, you know, just to kind of give you, we get a lot of requests. So we do require a four week minimum request time. Um, so the earlier you can let us know, the better. Um, and, and some of it is doing the research and checking the websites to make sure that it's actually needed because perhaps it only needs one or two letters of rec in the secondary school report and the counselor letter is not required. So it really just depends on the schools. And then also check the school websites for the SAT, ACT policies now because they are in flux. So out of state schools, there's a lot of colleges um, and uh, that some of them have a higher acceptance rates and are not quite as competitive as our UCs. So many have a wide range of GPAs um, and test scores and I always have TBD to be determined because again, we don't know what that's going to look like, um, but also to consider the cost of attendance. There is a website called what we call WUI. It stands for Western Undergraduate Exchange. Um, and I'll go to that slide. And these are residents of students that are um, in the Western states. So it's all the Western states from um, Colorado, West, including Hawaii and Alaska. And these are, uh, they give reduced um, tuition rates. Uh, and so you, it's, it's not consistent with all of them. So you need to go on the website and look at the institutions and what kinds of tuition reduction they do as part of this agreement. But it's a good website to check out. So the students are gonna hear about several different other types of application. The common application is one that our students use a lot. Um, this is an application that is not accepted by the UC and the CSU. The UCs and the Cal States have their own. The UCs has theirs the, that's system-wide and the Cal States have theirs that are system-wide. But the common application does have um, increasingly more out-of-state public. It does have some international and it has a lot of private schools on it. And as of right now, there's about 900 schools and it's ever increasing. And so they can use one application and go to multiple. I think the max is 20 that they can do on the common application. The application window opens for this class of 2022, August 1st, 2021. So again, they can get on the application. Students can actually get on the application right now, but they have to be really careful that they're picking the application rollover feature because if they don't, and they get themselves into the wrong year, it's gonna erase everything. And so um, when they open the application, they put their correct year and then it will roll for them. And then there's another one uh, which students are hearing about. It's called Coalition. It doesn't have near the number of institutions on it, but there are some exclusive inst institutions and one of which is University of Washington, which is very, very popular for our students to apply to. So I just bring that, um, I bring that up because there are some schools that are exclusive to this application only. So in choosing colleges, things to consider, first and foremost, does it have the major? 
Does it fit the career goals? Does it have several majors? So perhaps maybe you're undecided and you have, you're thinking between two majors. Um, does it have both majors so you don't have to transfer? The school size, the location, the weather, you know, for example, like we just had a major snowstorm on the East Coast. So if you don't like cold weather, perhaps maybe that's not a place to go. Or maybe you don't want to be in the desert. So whatever, whatever uh, type of uh, location is interesting. Um, public and private, a lot of that has to do with cost. Housing guarantees, do they have study abroad program? Um, one of the things with the cost of attendance, have a realistic conversation as a family. Some of these institutions are up to close to $80,000 a year now. That's a lot of money. Um, and some families have the ability or have planned, um, you know, there are financial aid, ways to get financial aid and that, and that sort of thing, but be realistic. Um, you know, we have had students who have gotten um, accepted, you know, to college of their dreams, and then they figure out how much it's going to cost, and it's disappointing, and then they're kind of scrambling. Maybe they didn't get the, the financial aid package that they thought they were going to get. Um, and also to research the, scho the scholarship and financial aid institutions. So while you're researching those individual college websites, make sure you're checking out the financial aid pages of those colleges as well to see what types of um, perhaps institutional scholarships that your student may qualify for. And so generally, you know, we like students to have um, some safety schools on their list, um, what we call likely schools, and then one to two reach schools. One of the things here at Del Norte is that we see lists that have a lot of reach schools on them. Um, and we really like students to balance out so that they know that they have a few schools on there that they absolutely know that they can get into. So here's the big one, to test or not to test? That is the question. So what's happening with SAT and ACT? So the answer is it totally depends on a lot of different things. So we ask you to check directly on the college universities. Again, it's early yet. Um, it's kind of the, it's still to be determined for fall of 2022. Um, you know, as things open up, test sites will begin to open up. Keep in mind again that the UCs will not consider SAT or ACT scores when making admissions decisions for, for um, the fall of 2022. And the CSUs have not announced yet, but they did suspend the use of them for this year's, for 2021's class. And so there's some new language that's coming on board having to do with um, standardized testing. And so I wanted to go over that. Test required is exactly what we've always known. It's pretty much the standard that we've always gone by that um, SAT or ACT is required in the admissions process. And now we're hearing words like test optional. Test optional means this is schools that will let you decide if you wanna put in and submit your test scores. If, you, if you're a good tester, you've done well, you think you've done well and you want that as taken into account as part of your application, you can submit them. But you don't necessarily have to on test optional. Keep in mind that if the test scores aren't there, they're gonna weigh more heavily on classes and activities and that sort of thing. Um, test flexible. And this is again, something that it has been sort of um, coming, rising to the top. Um, and these are schools that let students submit different types of tests to satisfy other than just the SAT or ACT. Um, they are accepting SAT subject tests going to go over that in a minute because College Board just canceled all of the rest of those. So, but it, some of you have them. So I think that some schools will still be accepting some of those, at least for your class, if you have them. Um, and then advanced placement scores. NYU is like this. They are what we call test flexible. Um, test blind means that the college and university has completely suspended the use of the scores and will not consider the scores even if you submit them. And then there's one other thing that is um, starting to be of conversation. Princeton does this and, and Brown also are two universities. They allow students to submit what we call evidence-based writing samples. Basically it's a graded English paper. 
So as you're getting your graded English papers, particularly in 11th grade, and they have your teacher comments on them, save them. You may be able to submit them as part of your application, just depends on the schools. If you're interested in finding out more about testing, um, there is a website called fairtest.org. It's the National Center for Fair and Open Testing, and they've been keeping up um, with a lot of information concerning the changes that are going on with SAT and ACT, standardized testing. So the recent announcements from the college board, immediately they have discontinued the subject exams. They've discontinued the SAT essay. Um, they're looking to, and, and kind of as a result of that, they're trying to come up with a more flexible way, possibly doing digital. It's not there yet, but that's what they're talking about to um, meet the evolving needs of students. Um, they're also working to provide as many opportunities for the class of 2022 to take the SAT. Um, so what they're saying is that as the test sites and the um, are opening up, what they would have used for um, those seats for subject exams, um, they're allocating for additional SAT. So they're trying to expand their capacity. Um, the big thing that I can tell you is just check their website. Um, so considering uh, when you're deciding on testing, do your research. Do your research. Colleges and universities have varied admissions requirements with um, different GPAs, uh, different courses, um, you know, what they need as part of the application, um, the testing requirements. So look at your college list. Once you make your college list, is it necessary or required? If you have five that it's not required and you put one on there where it is required, then you would need to take it. Some scholarships may still require scores. So that's one of the things that we're finding is that the scholarships aren't necessarily keeping up with the changes of the admissions. Um, so that's another thing to consider. Also distance from home and availability, the safety of the testing sites. I mean, we're hearing stories about families who are driving hours to get to, um, to testing sites. So really it's about safety first. Um, and if it's optional, do the other parts of your, so if the testing is part of the admissions process, if it's optional, does it demonstrate your strengths? Um, and if it does, then add it to your application. If it doesn't, then don't. It just really depends this next year. I wish I had more concrete answers, but it's going to be evolving and we're gonna find out more information as time goes on. I know it's stressful. And this is just, you know, how do you sign up? You go on their websites. Again, safety first. So currently there's limited testing sites due to the impact of COVID. So just check their websites for dates and availability. So I've known students who have signed up and then their test site got canceled. So this is just a word about um, digital literacy and academic honesty. Um, when you're applying to college, create a college appropriate email and use that email consistently because that's how they communicate is through email. So if you're missing something as part of your application, if they want you to set up a portal on their website to check your application status, it's all gonna come through email. Um, also, social media. So the internet, quote unquote, is written in ink. So what you post online can be permanent. So the bottom line is, if you wonder, should I post this? If you're questioning, don't post it. Joining student groups. When you join a student group, and this is something that students do all the time, they wanna be part of UCLA's student group or they wanna be part of you know, um, UC Irvine's student group. When you do that, you've opened them up to everything. So as soon as you join, they can see your whole platform. Um, and so be aware of that, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, you know, they encourage you to, but be aware of what's on there. And if you've never Googled yourself, Google it. And maybe you need to do some cleanup. Um, and do know that colleges do ask about academic honesty and other inappropriate behavior. So there are parts that um, counselors fill out actually as part of the secondary school report that ask us if a student has had any kind of academic dishonesty or any kind of um, behavioral infractions. Um, and so, you know, just be aware of that. 
that um, your presence and your digital presence now is 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 more important than ever, especially since there's so many different platforms now. So what's next? Um, the college search, that's what's next. And I know that this can be kind of nerve wracking and um, you know we're here for students um, and we have a lot planned um, uh, unfolding throughout the spring and all through next fall. So one of the things is the Naviance program. And I know that our students have heard this over and over again, but the reality is as a senior, you have to use this program because that's how we submit your letters of recommendation and um, your transcripts. So we want you to get on there. Um, we will do our Naviance presentations, although they may be through, um, through Zoom, but we're gonna do them um, in April to kind of get you back on there. Um, if you had an account before, you can hit the, I forgot my password and it should send you a new password. Um, if you've never been on it, then um, go on our school website and it tells you how to reset and what to do. And uh, we can get it set up for you. You can always email your counselor or you can email Mrs. Stone and Mrs. Reich and we can get it set for you if you have difficulty. And that's parents also, because you have parents as, as uh, you also have separate accounts. And so this is what the homepage of Naviance looks like when you become a senior. So right around uh, the beginning of August, your homepage will change. Um, and on that homepage, and the reason why I say read more is that students open up the Naviance and they don't read, they don't open up the entire page. And on that entire page is detailed, detailed, detailed information on, on um, like steps on how to do things because we know that this is a lot of information. And so we actually have a step-by-step -step guide um, and links to PowerPoints and that kind of thing. So all they have to do is click the read more and that whole page um, opens up so they don't have to remember the resources and tools are there for them. Um, also, there's a really good college search um, piece in here, and there is a really good scholarship search um, on Naviance, amongst other things. And we do teach them how to use this as well as they um, as the fall unfolds. So we do encourage you to visit our counseling website. Um, th this is this list I have it pulled down, but this is only about a third of what's actually the tabs that are on there. Um, the course request information will be on there as well. So um, the um, course request packets, like copies of the course re request packets, the PowerPoints and that kind of thing will all be on there. Your students will get those, but this will also be accessible to parents through the website as well. Okay, financial aid. Just quickly on financial aid. This is something that happens starting in October. The FAFSA is the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. It is based on um, a year back on taxes, so it's not the current year taxes. Um, and that's kind of the main application. Some private universities, um, and it mostly is private universities, the one that costs a little bit more, also require you to fill out what's called a CSS profile. It's a supplemental to the FAFSA. And that's um, specific to particular universities. If, and that's also on the college we website, college board website. So if you go on the college board website and you go down to the bottom, you'll see a link for a CSS profile. Click on that and it will give you a list of colleges. You can access a list of colleges that actually require this supplemental piece. And the deadlines for financial aid vary. And so this is another area where it's kind of a pitfall for students because they watch the application deadline, but then they don't watch their financial aid deadline. Um, and so they need to make sure that they're doing those in tandem. Um, the Cal grant is something that kind of happens automatically. Um, your students will need something called a Cal grant GPA verification and our registrar does it um, electronically in late fall. So that'll be done for your student. The federal aid submission um, begins in October and ends in March. Again, that will depend on the college deadline also because some colleges may want you to have it in long before then, especially if your students are doing early. Um, check the individual college and university financial aid websites. Merit, merit aid is based on academics and GPA and a lot of schools have that. And then also to reiterate that Naviance has a scholarship search and a local scholarship list and financial aid resources on it as well.
So one other thing that I want to point out is that the University of California has what they call um, the Blue and Gold Opportunity Plan. Students have to complete the federal aid form, um, but if they qualify, it's for family with families with income below eighty thousand, and that's something that's awarded um, at the back end of the the federal aid. So the form, the FAFSA form, goes into the university. Um, and then the university creates the package. And if your family qualifies, they would offer you the blue and gold opportunity plan. Or they also have one called the middle class scholarship program, which is 177,000 or below. And then the Cal States have something similar to, the, to that as well. So upcoming um, college fairs, this is just some virtual ones. NACAC um, is, offering quite a few virtual college fairs over the next few months. And they can register. All you have to do is register on the virtual college fairs. And then there's also a Black College Expo. The one for San Diego is February 18th from 12 to 3. And that also has a registration link. These are additional ones. Big Future Days Regional College Fairs. This is actually on the College Board website. And then we also have for Del Norte, and this is something again through your Naviance account. If you go on your Naviance account and you go to colleges and then research colleges and the college visits, you will see times that college reps are either here on campus and right now it's virtual um, and the registration is open and the Zoom link is available on that day where you just click right now for Zoom, you just click and you get into the Zoom and you can meet with college reps. And so those dates and times are posted. Right now, there's a few. They do increase throughout, uh, all the way up through April. And then again in the fall, and we will get probably close to 100 rep visits from different colleges and universities. So that's where you can find who's visiting Del Norte. Um, NCAA, just really quickly, if you are an athlete and you are looking to um, play sports at the collegiate level, you must register on the NCAA Eligibility Center. That's something that you should do by the end of your junior year. You can, you can register now. By the end of your junior year, they will ask for a transcript with your final junior grades on it. And that's on the Eligibility Center. They also have, um, just the way the UCs have their course requirements, Division I, Division II have their course requirements. They're similar to college requirements, um, but there are a few differences on them. And it differs between D1 and D2. So those are those 16 year long courses. And that's on the NCAA website. There's a really good student um, athletic guide on the NCAA website, college, um, college athletics for the student, for the college bound athletes. And so next steps, um, if you're applying for a four year university for this next fall, doesn't seem possible. That literally is, you know, eight months from now. Um, that's when it starts to hit home. So start to research those standardized testing admissions policies and the application policies because they will continue to um, evolve. College bound athletes, again, go to NCAA, uh, get on the eligibility center. College and career scholarship exploration, Naviance, um, you know, and asking questions, come to our drop-ins. Um, we're here to help. Also building your resume. This is something, you know, students always say, what can I do in the meantime between now and actually being able to fill out my applications? Organize, collect all your volunteer hours, your awards, activities. These applications ask all of this. Um, you know, what time, also, are you gonna do, are there any summer research opportunities? There's a lot being offered online. Um, haven't heard a lot about in person. There are a few that they're going to try, um, but there are quite a few online as well that are continuing to happen throughout the summer. And then research and visit colleges and universities. Um, hopefully we'll be able to travel again by the spring, but if not, there's many, many, many um, virtual tours that are online. Okay, so what do we do? Only a few more slides here. Finish grade 11 successfully. So in other words, maximum balance, ma maximum success, use your tools, um, complete your assignments, study for your test, grade, grades matter. 
but also make sure that you're balancing your time, especially now, you know, make sure that you're getting out and trying to do some things for yourself, um, you know, get exercise, get out and get some fresh air. I mean, we know this is a difficult year. It's difficult for us too. Um, and grade 12. So these are some of the up and coming things that we have. We will have a grade 12 parent night in September. Um, where we'll go into even more specifics about the college application. Um, we hold weekly workshops for students throughout September, October, and November. We work on Naviance. We do a college application overview. We do a workshop on how to fill out the CSU application, how to fill out the UC application, how to fill out the common application. And then in addition to that, we do weekly drop-in sessions all the way until November, until the end of November where we're available to help students. So just a quick overview, what's up and coming? Um, on our website, check out the senior news tab as your student gets into senior year. There's a lot of information on there. Again, the information for the CRF will be there and the information on how to get on Naviance amongst a lot of other information. Make sure that you're reading the, the newsletters that are coming out. Um, every month we have a counseling newsletter and we have weekly e-blasts and there are a lot of detailed information and specifically scholarships um, are also in that, uh, on those uh, e-blasts. Um, we try and send out reminders. We have e-blasts that go out specifically that are targeting seniors as well. So that's something that is um, super important to make sure that you're reading. Um, Check the email for any Zoom link meeting links because that's where we'll be sending out the general links for things. Um, again, we're gonna have those student, we're, we're gonna have another round since we don't have homerooms. So typically each year we go back and we go into the junior homerooms. Unclear, it doesn't look like homerooms are necessarily going to happen. So we're going, we're going to be setting up uh, what we call Q&A drop-ins for juniors in April and May. Um, tentatively, they're going to be on Monday afternoons. That's what we're talking about. And we'll have, juniors will have an opportunity to actually drop in, meet with their counselor, and ask questions during that time. We'll send those dates out as we firm them up. Um, we also have had some juniors ask, can we have a senior panel? So in other words, can we have seniors who have been through this process? Um, and so they're working on, we have a group of juniors that are working on that. We're looking tentatively in May to hold that. We have our CRF classroom presentations, our CRF student drop-ins, the parent drop-ins. We're going to have Naviance drop-in sessions where students can go over and learn a little bit more about their Naviance program and how that's gonna work for their senior year. Again, to reiterate the fall application process, we do a UC, a CSU, and a common application presentation. It's critical that the students come to those because how they put their, they list their courses in, in those applications um, is, is really important. Um, and then fall year senior application drop-in workshops. And then we also have that senior year parent night as well. So that is it. So questions. Maybe some of my counselors who are on have some questions in the chat. I mean, we answered quite a bit of them. You did? Yeah. Yes, I think we've been answering them in the chat for most of the um, presentation. So I'm not sure if there are any others that we uh, missed. I think we really hit most of them. Okay, somebody has a raised hand, it looks like. I can't see who that uh, is. Let's see. So will you be posting this on our website? Yes, it will be on the counseling website under the presentations tab. Uh, let's see. UCs aren't considering letters of rec, but are scholarships considering them? Yes. Many scholarships ask for letters of recommendation. And there are many that don't also. Yeah. So it's kind of split. Depends. 
Yeah. It depends on the scholarship. There's one, how does the parents' Naviance access differ from their student's Naviance account? Basically, the, the student has like full rights and responsibility. Like they can add colleges, delete colleges. You know, they have access to, you know, kind of changing that. Whereas parents have a little bit less access. Like you can't remove stuff from their account. And there's other, a few other um, like parts of the, of, of the program that you, you can't use to the full extent the student does, but it's pretty similar. Mm -hmm. There is a question, does the CSU application require an essay? No, no, it's very quite simple application. You report your um, classes and grades that you've earned in high school. Um, and it's, there's not a lot else. It's very, a very simple application, no essay required. One of the questions, will there be P waivers for athletics that start this year, such as cross country? Yeah, there, there is a discussion about that happening. Um, I would speak directly with your coach and then the coach will most likely communicate with our athletic director and then loop us into the mix. So I, I think a lot of it has to do with whether they can compete and it's an unfolding question. We're talking about it. Uh, there's a question, when should we ask our teachers about a letter of recommendation? Um, we always want um, students to be cautious and make sure that they actually need a letter of recommendation before having a staff member prepare one. Um, but if you're thinking that you may need letters of recommendation and for colleges in the fall, then you should be looking on those college websites to see if they require a teacher letter of recommendation. If they do, then um, we you could have a conversation with the teacher or two that you're considering um, before summer break. And then when you return in the fall, you can again touch base with that scene that that teacher. Um, confirming again that they are able to write the letter of recommendation. There are some teachers that have a process that doesn't start until we return to school in the fall. There's a bit of a lottery that they do. Um, so um, really that's something that we want to really stress that you wanna make sure you actually know you need a letter of recommendation. And then um, before summer break, you could approach your teacher regarding that request. Um, the code, here's a Naviance question. The code for DNHS Naviance doesn't seem to work for me. How would students be able to access Naviance? Kathy, I'll let you, Ms. Marin, I'll let you take that. The code meaning the, I'm assuming they mean the sign-in code. Um, there could be several reasons. Uh, it could be that an email has changed. Um, the, the Naviance changed for students. It used to be that they could use their student ID number and they can't do that anymore. They have to use an email as a sign-in and it can't be their student, their Poway student email because that doesn't get email outside of Canvas. So it has to be a Gmail or a Yahoo or whatever the um, email is. <clears throat> um, and same with parents. So um, try first putting in the email and then, then saying, I forgot password and see if it will, the system itself will send it to the email. If not, I would suggest e um, either emailing Mrs. Reich, Mrs. Stone or your counselor and we can reset it for you. Um, I think that we have hit upon most questions. Uh, uh, go ahead, Mr. Rodin. This is a good question. How do the colleges recognize a GPA from DNHS compared to other schools? Um, yeah, so, so colleges have a <clears throat> kind of their own like system of ranking, so to speak, that they, that they kind of use to understand like how a GPA fits within a certain school, you know, cause a GPA of a 4.0 at Del Norte is different from a GPA at, I don't know, East Lake High School or something, you know, I mean, they're, they're different. So um, 
yeah, I mean, you don't you don't really know exactly what they're doing, but that we know that there is a they have a system of yeah, more or less it's it's kind of a ranking system, and they uh, they, they use that to uh, factor in things. Mm -hmm. I mean, keep in mind that um, students are evaluated within the context of their high school. Um, and so, you know, they are aware of what Del Norte offers. The other thing is that we have a school profile that goes in with the transcripts. Um, and so it does give more details specifically about the courses that are available and, um, you know, the type of um, grading that we do and you know our grading scale and so on and so forth so it gives them more specific detail like which classes are weighted um what you know the community that the school is um located um the composite of the school itself so that document goes in um and is is sent in with the transcript to the schools yeah, there's another question do you think college results is this year will be quite different for seniors because of the lack of test scores and the many extra applications. I don't personally, I don't know, but I don't think it will be much different. I think it'll be pretty similar. Um, mm -hmm. I think they'll use previous year's data and, you know, all the colleges out there know what, like Ms. Marin was talking about, like what schools offer and what type of schools they are. So I, I, I mean, I can't say I know the answer, but my guess is it won't be that much different. Mm -hmm. I agree. I don't, I mean, so far the seniors this year have done the ones that we've heard about have done pretty well so far. I haven't seen that there has been a huge shift um, in, in differences in um, admission rates. Seems pretty similar. So the colleges are figuring it out. Yeah, there's another question. Do colleges have a quota of freshmen per high school that they adhere to? No, um, no, <laughs> no, no, they, don't. they do not. And, and, no. and to be honest with you, even if they did, you wouldn't know. <laughs> so, but they don't. Yeah. I uh, I think that's about it. I think we've covered pretty much everything. Uh, there's a question, what is the preferred Cal State University at Del Norte? I suppose um, San Diego State, uh, uh, San Luis Obispo, Dave, um, what? Um, San Marcos, I would say. Cal State San Marcos. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Thank was you. The question, was the yeah. question asking what's the most popular Cal States for? I think so. Preferred. Mm -hmm. well, Preferred? Depends on the student, really. Yeah. Depends on the major. Yeah. Depends on where they want to apply. San Diego State. We have a lot that apply to San Diego State every year. Okay, well, I All think right. Have a good night, wrap everyone. It up for the evening. We super appreciate all of you attending. Um, let us know if you have any questions uh, along the way. We'll be meeting with your students, um, trying to stay in contact as best we can. Um, maybe we'll get to see them in person by the end of the year. Wouldn't that be nice? All right, thank you so much.